Ever wonder why this has dragons carved on it? Well, to answer that question, we first got to spend a long, long time talking about trees. The world of Elden Ring is made up of parallels. Some of them are obvious, like how Moog and Morgoth are a set of cursed twins born of America's line, and Mikkel and Millennia are a set of cursed twins born of America's line. Others are a bit more subtle, like how Gold Mask and the Two Fingers both interpret the greater will through finger gestures, or like how all the finger readers are blind. The point of this series is to document these parallels, because I think they're neat, and then to ask the big questions, like, what's the point? And hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll be convinced there is one. One of the most common parallels is things, often people, transforming into trees. Sometimes this is quite literal, but other times it's symbolic, and we'll have to peel back a layer of metaphor to really understand it. Unless you know what to look for, you find that there's lots of cases of either trees transforming into dragons, or dragons transforming into trees. And before we even get started, I want to say that this idea isn't too far-fetched. This is a world where people turn into dragons, and people turn into trees, and dragons turn into people. Dragons turning into trees just completes the picture. And so, what started off with a fun bit of trivia about the origin of the term grafted scion turned into something that may have some fundamental insights to the nature of the crucible in the Elden Ring itself. It's just as crazy as it sounds. We're gonna have a good time. Let's get started. I wanted to take a quick second to shout out these two, who don't show any specific transformation symbolism, but do demonstrate that dragon trees and tree dragons are, at the very least, a thing in this world. Also, the tree spirits are lizards and breathe fire, and I think we can all agree draconic is an apt term for them. They're not dragons in context, but they symbolize them all the same, and we're going to be dealing a lot in symbolism, so best get used to it now. The dragonkin, meanwhile, are clearly dragons. Failed dragons, but still dragons. And while it may be easy to miss, their design clearly features tree roots throughout. I couldn't tell you why that is in context, but we can see that it is indeed a part tree dragon. Now that we've established that whole symbolism thing, get this. Tree sentinels are trees. They're solid gold, an obvious earth tree connection even in context, and the plumage on their helm is deliberately designed to look like a tree. And if that wasn't enough, it's right there in their name. Tree sentinels. Are they sentinels who defend the tree, or are they sentinels who are trees? Perhaps both. When the dragons attack Landell, however, the tree sentinels realized they would not be able to stop them unless they became dragons themselves. Those aren't even my words. And the transformation was very thorough. They attack with dragon claws and the dragon's red lightning, and wouldn't you know it, but their steeds breathe fire. These trees have made a transformation into dragons. The perfumers, believe it or not, undergo pretty much the exact same transformation. In their original state, their robes designs are all white and gold, the holy colors of the Erd tree, and their aprons feature an Erd tree embroidered on the front. But at some point, they felt the need to exterminate the Omen, whose closeness to the Crucible gives them some dragon symbolism that we'll discuss in a bit. And in order to do this, they began wearing masks that resemble Omen nightmares and wielding weapons consisting of Omen horns. In other words, they became like the Omens themselves. This one's my favorite, so get this. Godric the Grafted is a tree. He's big and green, with arms that look like branches and legs that look like trunks. And what's more, the name of the grafted scions, who are enacting the exact same symbolism, has a delightful pun in their name. Grafting is a thing you do with trees, that one's obvious, but did you know that the branch you graft onto the tree is called a scion? Shout out to TV Tropes for that one. So they look like trees, and their name contains not one, but two tree puns. Sounds like someone wants us to think of these guys as trees. And a quick aside here, I know some people are going to be like, but you can't look into the names like that because they're localizations of Japanese names. But let's not forget this game's founding lore was initially written in English by a guy who speaks American. I check out things in both languages frequently just to be safe, but I think Elden Ring might be an exception to the standard FromSoft rule that the Japanese version holds infinite precedence. What does Godric the Tree Person do? Well, in a struggle against you the player, he decapitates a dragon, more on that in another video, and grafts its head onto his arm, and in doing so, gains dragon powers, including dragon fire. Godric the Tree Person, through the power of grafting, has become, at once, a tree and a dragon. And as a side note, but it's interesting that Godric had to cut off his own arm in order to gain this power, reflecting the way the fire giant had to remove its leg to unlock its own fire power. A symbolic offering, perhaps? 
This is where shit gets juicy, so let's take our time and be thorough. The aspect of the Crucible incantations also summon body parts associated with the ancient Crucible of Life. But they're also pretty clearly all dragon parts. You've got the tail aspect, like a dragon's tail, wings, unavailable to the player, like what dragons have, horns, like a dragon's horn, and lest we forget, a throat sack incantation for breathing fire, which is one of those things that's just always draconic. This connection between Crucible and dragons is exemplified by the Crucible Knights, who really might as well just be called Dragon Knights. They have wings and fly, they swipe at you with their tails and ram you with their horns, and oh yeah, they breathe fire. But lo and behold, at least one class of these dragon-esque knights are specifically called out as being trees. Therefore, for the Crucible Tree Knights at least, they symbolically link trees, dragons, and the Crucible all at once. And this is where the omens come back into the discussion as well. Beings covered in horns who occasionally spew fire and they're connected to the Primordial Crucible? It's no surprise that we find their story paralleling the one of the dragons. They themselves parallel the dragons. But what about their counterparts, the Axe Knights? Well, I'll admit I'm a bit fuzzy on that one, which is good, because everything I'm discussing works fine without it. In context, the Axe almost certainly represents the Axe of Lord Godfrey, but metaphorically? Well, Axes are used to cut down trees, and we've got more than one example of Axes being used in ritual decapitation. More on that in another video. But in this video and that one, we're gonna have to talk about Destined Death, so let's get on that. Destined Death has the effect of killing you by turning you into a tree. Lich Dragon Vortisax, a dragon corrupted by Destined Death, is a dragon turning into a tree. Like, that isn't even metaphorical. He's sprouting branches. Truth is, there's a lot going on with Vortisax's design, and we'll come back to it in future videos, but for now, I want to highlight that its story makes a very neat parallel to the story of the Elden Beast. Both are dragons contained in the mind body dream of someone else bound to a tree and both are dragon trees right let's take a minute to talk about that so the elden beast is a dragon this is certain it looks like a dragon it has wings and flies like a dragon it breathes fire and lest there be any doubt its name in elden ring's code is nebula dragon However, it lives inside of a tree, and the appearance of what is either branches or roots on its tail imply that it is also a tree. Just like we've seen before, the Elden Beast is, at once, a tree and a dragon. This, to me, is kind of the ultimate culmination of these parallels. Trees turning into dragons, dragons turning into trees, to me, it all comes back to the Elden Beast. A half-dragon, half-tree hybrid with no head, put a pin in that one, living inside a tree. The trick now is interpreting it. And I'll admit, I'm not entirely certain where to go with it. That's part of the reason why this video exists and why I brought this channel back. To get as many people thinking about this game in the same stupid way as I do so we can start hammering these details out. But it would be remiss of me not to take a stab at it, so let's see if we can't figure something out. We know from Hieta's dialogue that it was the greater will that divided the one great, likely the Crucible, in order to create life in the world. And unless you want to assume there was much of a world before this, this is probably the beginning of the timeline. This would have been done by sending the Elden Beast to the Lands Between, where it would have transformed into the Elden Ring so it could apply logic and order to the formless chaos. For that is what the Elden Ring does, create order and dictate the logic of the world. All of this is readily available backstory and not really related to what I'm talking about. What I am suggesting is that, perhaps, the Primordial Crucible was not just some empty vessel of power waiting to be harvested by whatever entrepreneurial outer god found it first. Perhaps it was a dragon. And perhaps it was transformed into the Great Tree. The Great Tree is real. How? Well, I've got a video coming up that may have answers, but spoiler warning, it may have involved some form of ritual decapitation. If this is indeed true, it would be an example of the Chaos Conf myth. A myth where a god, usually a storm god, slays a dragon and goes on to form some sort of kingdom or empire, a new world. This idea is referenced in Dark Souls 1, where Gwyn slayed the dragons with his lightning before going on to found Lordran. The example we have here isn't so obvious, but I think it fits the same. It specifically reminds me of the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation myth that features a dragon, sometimes, named Tiamat who existed in a timeless void before things like gods and destiny existed, and who was slain by a storm god, perhaps, named Marduk, who then used her remains to fashion the whole world. This idea is paralleled and inverted by the final battle with the Elden Beast, 
This dragon's an embodiment of order, not chaos, but we still kill it in the hopes of fashioning a new world. Parallels are a big part of the way George R.R.R. Martin creates his world, because they're a great way to give your world narrative cohesion and also to hide the answers to super deep lore mysteries that might not have had the space in the story otherwise. This analysis was heavily inspired by the work of YouTuber Lucifer Means Lightbringer, and if you think everything I brought up today sounds like I'm talking nonsense, then I encourage you to check out his channel and see all the ways George has incorporated this style of worldbuilding into his A Song of Ice and Fire series. Oh, and that bit I mentioned about the Forge of the Giants? Well, it is a giant crucible. Like, that's what it is. Considering all the symbolism we've talked about today, we should expect to find dragons associated with it. Now, is this THE Crucible of Life? I don't know, it might be. We would also expect to find it in a tree, given what we've talked about. So is the mountaintops of the giants a tree? I don't know, it might be. Let's just wrap this up. Next time, decapitation and ritual sacrifice. Don't lose your heads, and stay tuned.